His ears hurt too, from the echoey whining racket of the drill, a hundred nightmares of the dentist's chair. He kept an eye on his watch, telling himself he'd just work until the morning shift came on duty, to reduce the risk that the sound would be heard. But it was still an hour away from shift change when the battery on his drill died, and he discovered that the last time he'd switched batteries. He'd neglected to push the dead one all the way into the charger, and now both his batteries were dead. That was as good an excuse as any to stop. He fingered the dent he'd made in the sheet steel through all his hours of drilling. His fingertip probed it, but barely seemed to sink in at all. He detached a chair from its anchors and dragged it over, stood on it, and put an eye to it, and saw a pinprick of dirty gray light, the first light of dawn, glimmering at the bottom of his drill hole. Sleep did not help his arms. If anything, it just made them worse. It took him five minutes just to get to the point where he could lift his arms over his face, working them back and forth. He had a little pot of tiger balm, the red, smelly Chinese muscle rub, in his first aid box, and he worked it into his arms, shoulders, chest and neck, thinking, as he did. This stuff isn't doing anything. A few minutes later, a new burning spread across his skin, a fiery, minty feeling, hot and cold at the same time. It was alarming at first, but a few seconds later, it was incredible, like his muscles were all letting go of their tension at once. He took up his drill, checked his watch, middle of the first shift, but screw it, the engines were groaning, no one would hear it, and went to work. He punched through five minutes later. Five minutes. He'd been so close. He put his eye to the hole again, saw sky, clouds, the shadows of other containers nearby. His wireless antenna awaited. It had a big heavy magnetic base, powerful rare earth magnets that he'd used to attach it to its earlier spot. They'd worked so well that he'd had to plant both feet on either side of it and heave, like he was pulling up a stubborn carrot. Now he didn't need the base. Just the willowy wand of the antenna itself. He disassembled the antenna, reattached it to the bare wire ends, and then gently, gingerly, fed it through his dime-sized hole. He had a moment's pause as he fed it up, picturing it sticking up among the even, smooth surfaces of the container tops, as obvious as a boner at the chalkboard, but he'd been drilling for so long, it seemed crazy to stop now. A voice in his head told him that getting caught was even crazier, but he shut that voice up by telling it to shut up, since getting information on the ship's status would be vital to completing his mission. And then the antenna was up. He grabbed his laptop and logged into the network and began snaffling up traffic. He could watch it in real time, his sniffer would helpfully group intercepted emails, clicks, pages, search terms and IMs into their own reporting panels, but that was just frustrating, like watching a progress bar creep across the screen. Instead he went inside his sanctum and made himself a cup of instant ramen noodles, using a little more of his precious electricity and water, and then opened up a can of green tea with soy milk to wash it down. He ate as slowly as he could. Trying to savor every bite and tell his stomach that food was okay, despite the rock and roll of the past day. During the meal, he heard footsteps near his container, the grumble of heavy machinery working at the containers, and his mouth went dry at the thought of his antenna sticking up there. Why had he put it there? Because he couldn't bear the thought of sitting, bored and restless, in his box for days more. Why was he doing any of it? Why was he on his way to China? Why had he left home to be a gamer? Why had he learned Chinese in the first place? Trapped with his own thoughts, he found himself confronting some pretty ugly answers. He hadn't wanted to be like all the other kids. He'd wanted to stand out, be special. Different. To know and understand and be skilled at things that his father didn't know anything about. To triumph. To be a part of something bigger than himself, but to be an important part. To be romantic and special. To care about a justice that his friends didn't even know existed. It made him all feel sad and pathetic and needy. It made him want to go plug into his laptop and get away from his thoughts. It worked. What he found on his laptop was nothing short of amazing. First there was a haul of photos emailed from the captain back to the shipping company, showing the cargo deck of the ship looking like a tumbled Jenga tower, containers scattered everywhere, on their sides, on their backs, at crazy angles. It looked as if the entire top layer of boxes had slipped into the ocean, and then several more layers worth on the port side. He looked more closely. His container was on the starboard side, and the container from the corresponding position on the other side appeared to be gone. 
He looked up the ship's manifest, found the serial number of the container, matched it to a list of overboard boxes, swallowed. It had been pure random chance that put his box on the starboard side. If he'd gone the other way, he'd be raspberry jam in a crushed tin can at the bottom of the ocean. He scanned the email traffic for information about the mysterious stowaway, but it looked as though the storm had literally blown any concern over him overboard. The manifest he had listed the value for customs of all the containers on the ship. Most of them were empty, or at least partially empty, as there wasn't much that America had that China needed, except empty containers to fill with more goods to ship to America. Still, the total value of the missing containers went into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. He winced. That was going to be a huge insurance bill. Now it was time to get his email, something that he'd been putting off, because that was even riskier, if the ship's own administrators were wiretapping their own network. They'd see his traffic. Oh, it wouldn't look like email from him to Big Sister Noor and his Gildes and the Turks back in America. It'd look like gigantic amounts of random junk, originating on an internal address that didn't correspond to any known machine on the ship. Its destination was unclear, it hopped immediately into Tor. The onion router, which bounced it like a pea in a maraca around the globe's open relays. He was counting on the ship's lax IT security and the fact that the crew were always connecting up new devices like phones and handheld games they picked up in port to help him slide past the eyes of the network. Still, if they were looking for a stowaway, they might think of looking at the network traffic. He sat at his keyboard, fingers poised, and debated with himself. Deep down, he knew how this debate would end. He could no more stay off the network and away from his friends than he could stay cooped up in the tin can without poking his antenna off the ship. So he did it. Sent emails, watched the network traffic, held his breath. So far, so good. Then, a rumble and a clatter and a pair of thunderous clangs from above. His heart thudded in his ears and more metallic sounds crashed through the confined space. What was it? He placed the noises, connected them to the pictures he'd seen earlier. The crew had the forklift and tractor out, and the crane swinging, and they were rearranging the containers for stability and trim. He yanked his antenna in and dove for the inner sanctum, dogging his hatch and throwing all loose objects into the lockers before flinging himself over the bed and grabbing hold of the post and clinging to it with fingers and toes as the container rocked and rolled for the second time in 24 hours. Hash. So where'd you end up? Ping asked, passing Wei Dong another parcel of Long's Eye rice and chicken folded in a lotus leaf. Ping had wanted to go to the Pizza Hut, but Wei Dong had looked so hurt and offended at the suggestion, and had been so insistent on eating something real that he'd taken the Guaylo to a cafe in the Cantonese Quarter. Near the handshake buildings. Wei Dong had loved it from the moment they'd sat down, and had ordered confidently. Impressing both Ping and the waiter with his knowledge of South Chinese food. Wei Dong chewed, made a face. On the bloody top of the stack, three high, he said. With more containers sandwiched in on every side of me, except the door side, thankfully. But I couldn't climb down the stack with these. He thumped the dirty, beat-up cardboard boxes beside the table. So I had to transfer the cards to my backpack and then climb up and down that stack, over and over again, until I had it all on the ground. Then I threw down the collapsed cardboard boxes, climbed to the bottom, and boxed everything up again. Ping's jaw dropped. You did all that in the port. He thought of all the guards he'd seen, all the cameras. Wei Dong shook his head. No, he said. I couldn't take the chance. I did it at night, in relays, the night before we got in. And I covered it all in some plastic sheeting I had, which is a good thing because it rained yesterday. There was a lot of water on the deck and some of it leaked through the plastic, but the boxes seem okay. Let's hope the cards are still readable. I figure they must be, they're in plastic wrapped boxes inside. But what about the crew seeing you? Wei Dong laughed. Oh. I was shitting bricks the whole time over that. I promise. I was in full sight of the wheelhouse most of the time, though thankfully there wasn't any moon out. But yeah, that was pretty freaky. Ping looked at the guaylo, his skinny arms, the fuzz of pubescent mustache, the shaggy hair, the bad smell. When the boy had finally emerged from the gate. Confidently flashing some kind of badge at the guard. Ping had wanted to strangle him for being so late and for looking so relaxed about it. Now, though, he couldn't help but admire his old guilty. 
He said so. Wei Dong actually blushed, and his chest inflated, and he looked so proud that Ping had to say it again. I'm in awe, he said. What a story. I just did what I had to do, Wei Dong said with an unconvincing. Nonchalant shrug. His Mandarin was better than Ping remembered it. Maybe it was just being face to face rather than over a fuzzy, unreliable net link, the ability to see the whole body, the whole face. All of Ping's earlier worry and irritation melted away. He was overcome by a wave of affection for this kid who had traveled thousands of kilometers to be part of the same big guild. Don't take this the wrong way, he said. But I have to tell you this. A few hours ago, I was very upset with you. I thought it was just ego or stupidity, you're coming all this way with the boxes. I wanted to strangle you. I thought you were a stupid, spoiled. Dash quote. He saw the look on Wei Dong's face, pure heartbreak and stopped, held up his hands. Wait. What I'm trying to say is. I thought all this, but then I met you and heard your story, and I realized that you want this just as much as I do, and have as much at stake now. That you're a real, a real comrade. The word was funny, an old communist word that had been leached of color and meaning by 10 million hours of revolutionary song singing in school. But it fit. And it worked. Wei Dong's chest swelled up even bigger, like a balloon about to sail away, and his cheeks glowed like red coals. He fumbled for words, but his Chinese seemed to have fled him, so Ping laughed and handed him another lotus leaf, this one filled with seafood. Eat, he said. Eat, he checked the time on his phone, read the coded messages there from Big Sister Nor. You've got ten minutes to finish and then we have to get to the guild house for the big call. Hash. You're in a strange town, or a strange part of town. A little disoriented already. That's key. Maybe it's just a strange time to be out, first thing in the morning in the business district, or very late at night in clubland, or the middle of the day in the suburbs, and no one else is around. A stranger approaches you. He's well-dressed, smiling. His body language says. I am a friend, and I'm slightly out of place, too. He's holding something. It's a pane of glass, large, fragile, the size of a road atlas or a monopoly board. He's struggling with it. It's heavy. Slippery. As he gets closer, he says, with a note of self-awareness at the absurdity of this all. Can you please hold this for a second? He sounds a little desperate too, like he's about to drop it. You take hold of it. Fragile. Large. Heavy. Very awkward. And, still smiling, the stranger methodically and quickly plunges his hands into your pockets and begins to transfer your keys, wallet and cash into his own pockets. He never breaks eye contact in the 10 or 15 seconds it takes him to accomplish the task, and then he turns on his heel and walks away, he doesn't run. That's important, very quickly, for a dozen steps, and then he breaks into a wind sprint of a run, powering up like Daffy Duck splitting on Elmer Fudd. You're still holding onto the pane of glass. Why are you holding onto that pane of glass? What else are you going to do with it? Drop it and let it break on the strange pavement. Set it down carefully. Tell you one thing you're not going to do. You're not going to run with it. Running with a 10 kilo slab of sharp edged glass in your hands is even dumber than taking hold of it in the first place. Hash. What's at work here? Big Sister Nor was on the video conference window, with the mighty Krang and Just Bob to either side of her, heads down on their screens. Keeping the back channel text chat running while Big Sister Nor lectured. She was speaking Mandarin, then Hindi. The text chat was alive in three alphabets and five languages, and machine translations appeared beneath the words. English for Wei Dong. Chinese for his Gildes. There were a couple thousand people logged in direct, and tens of thousands due to check in later when they finished their shifts. Dingleberry in KL says, disorientation, the mighty Krang said, without looking up. Big sister nor nodded. And. Social contract, said Just Bob. That's M.R. Green in Singapore. BSN showed her teeth in a hard grin. Singapore, where they know all about the social contract. Yes, yes. That's just it. A person comes up to you and asks you for help, you help. It's in our instincts. It's in our upbringing. It's what keeps us all civilized. And then she told them a story of a group of workers in Phenom Pen, gold farmers who worked for someone who was supposed to be very kindly and good to them, took them out for lunch once a week. Brought in good dinners and movies to show when they worked late, but who always seemed to make small, mistakes, in their pay packets. 
Not much, and he was always embarrassed when it happened and paid up, and he was even more embarrassed when he forgot that it was payday and was a day. Two days, three days late paying them. But he was their friend, their good friend, and they had an unwritten contract with him that said that they were all good friends and you don't call your good friend a thief. And then he disappeared. They came to work one day, three days after pay day, and they hadn't been paid yet, of course, and the man who ran the internet cafe had simply shrugged and said he had no idea where this boss had gone. A few of the workers had even worked through the day, and even the next, because their good friend must be about to show up someday soon. And then their accounts stopped working, all the accounts, all the characters they'd been leveling, the personal characters they used for the big rare drop raids, everything. Some of them went home, some of them found other jobs. And eventually, some of them ran into their old boss again. He was running a new gold farm, with new young men working for him. The boss was so apologetic, he even cried and begged their forgiveness, his creditors had called in their loans and he'd had to flee to escape them, but he wanted to make it up to the workers, his friends, whom he'd loved as sons. He'd put them to work as senior members of his new farm, at double their old wages, just give him another chance. The first pay day was late. One day. Two days. Three days. Then, the boss didn't come to work at all. Some of the younger, newer workers wanted to work some more, because, after all, the boss was their dear friend. And the old hands, the ones who'd just been taken for a second time. They finally admitted to their fellow workers what they'd known all along, the boss was a crook, and he'd just robbed them all. That's how it works. You violate the social contract. The other person doesn't know what to do about it. There's no script for it. There's a moment where time stands still, and in that moment, you can empty out his pockets. There were more stories like this, and they made everyone laugh, sprinkles of kakekakeke in the chat, but when it was over, Wei Dong felt his first tremor of doubt. What is it? Jia asked him. She was very beautiful, and from what he could understand, she was a very famous radio person, some kind of local hero for the factory girls. It was clear that Lu was head over heels in love with her, and everyone else deferred to her as well. When she turned her attention on him, the whole room turned with her. The room, a flat in a strange old part of town, was crowded with people, hot and loud with the fans from the computers. It's just, he said, waved his hands. He was suddenly very tired. He hadn't had a nap or even a shower since sneaking out of the port, and meeting all these people, having the video conference with Big Sister nor, it was all so much. His Chinese fled him and he found himself fumbling for the words. He swallowed, thought it through. Look, he said. I want to help all the workers get a better deal, the Turks, the farmers, the factory girls. They all nodded cautiously. But is that what we're doing here? Are we going to win any rights by, you know, by being crooks? By ripping people off. The group erupted into speech. Apparently he'd opened up an old debate, and the room was breaking into its traditional sides. The Chinese was fast and slangy, and he lost track of it very quickly, and then the magnitude of what he'd done finally, really hit him. Here he was, thousands of miles from home, an illegal immigrant in a country where he stood out like a sore thumb. He was about to get involved in a criminal enterprise, hell he was already involved in it, that was supposed to rock the world to its foundations. And he was only 18. He felt two inches tall and as flat as a pancake. Wei Dong, one of the boys said, in his ear. It was Matthew, who had a funny, leathery, worn look to him, but whose eyes twinkled with intelligence. Come on, let's get you out of here. They'll be at this for hours. He looked Matthew up and down. Technically, they were Gyaldees, but who knew what that meant anymore? What sort of social contract did they really have, these strangers and him? Come on, Matthew said, and his face was kind and caring. We'll get you somewhere to sleep, find you some clothes. That offer was too good to pass up. Matthew led him out of the apartment, out of the building, and out in the streets. The sun had set while they were conferenced in, and the heat had gone out of the air. Matthew led him up and down several maze-like alleys, through some giant housing blocks, and then into another building, this one even more run down than the last one. They went up nine flights of stairs. And by the time they reached the right floor, Wei Dong felt like he would collapse. His thighs burned, his chest heaved and ached, and the sweat was coursing down his face and neck and back and butt and thighs. I had the same question as you, Matthew said. When I got out of jail. 
Wei Dong willed himself not to edge away from Matthew. The apartment was filled with thin mattresses, covering nearly the entire floor like some kind of crazy, thick carpet. They sat on adjacent beds, shoes off. Wei Dong must have made some sign of his surprise, because Matthew smiled a sad smile. I went to jail for going on strike with other Weblies. I'm not a murderer. Wei Dong. Wei Dong felt himself blushing. He mumbled an apology. I had a long talk with big sister Noor. Here's what she told me, she said that a traditional strike, where you take your labor away from the bosses and demand a better deal, that it wouldn't work here. That we needed to do that, but that we also needed to be able to show everyone who has us at their mercy that they've overrated their power. When the bosses say, we'll beat you up, or when the police say, we'll put you in jail, or when the game companies say, we'll throw you out, we need to be able to say, oh no you won't. The sheer delight he put into this last phrase made Wei Dong smile. Even though he was so tired he could barely move his face. He scrubbed at his eyes with the backs of his hands and said. Look. I think my emotions are on trampolines today. It's been a very big day, Matthew chuckled. You understand. I understand. I just wanted to let you know that this isn't just about being a crook. It's about changing the power dynamics in the battle. You're a fighter, you understand that. Don't you? I hear you play healers. You know what a raid is like with and without a healer. Wei Dong nodded. It's a very different fight, he said. Different tactics. Different feel. A different dynamic. There's math to describe it. You know. I found a research paper on it. It's fascinating. I'll email you a copy. What we're doing here. We're changing the dynamic. The balance of power, for workers everywhere. You'll see. Wei Dong yawned and waved his fist over his mouth weakly. You need to sleep, Matthew said. Good night, comrade. Wei Dong woke once in the night, and every mattress was filled, and everyone was snoring and breathing and snuffling and scratching. There must have been twenty guys in the room with him, a human carpet of restless energy. Cigarette and garlic breath. Foot odor, body odor, and muffled grumbles. It was so utterly unlike the ship, unlike his room in the Cecil Hotel in L.A., unlike his parents' home in Orange County. The ground actually felt like it was sloping away for a minute, like the storm-tossed deck of a container ship, and he thought for a wild, disoriented minute that there was an earthquake, and pictured the high-rise buildings he'd seen clustered together on the way over crashing into one another like dominoes. Then the land righted itself again and the panic dissipated. He thought of his mother and knew that he'd have to find a PC and give her a call the next day. They'd exchanged a lot of email while he was on the ship, a lot of reminisces about his dad, and he'd felt closer to her than he had in years. Thinking of his mother gave him an odd feeling of peace. Not the homesick he'd half expected, and he drifted off again amid the farts and the grunts and the human sounds of the human people he'd put himself among. Hash. Connor's fingerspitzengeful was going crazy. Like all the game runners, he had a sizable portfolio of game assets and derivatives. It wasn't exactly fair, betting on the future of game gold when you got a say in that future put you at a sizable advantage over the people on the other side of the bets. But screw him if they can't take a joke. Besides, his portfolio was so big and complex that he couldn't manage it himself. Like everyone else, he had a broker, a guy who worked for one of the big houses, a company that had once been an auto manufacturer before it went bankrupt, got bailed out, wrung out. Twisted and financialized until the only thing left of any value in it was the part of the company that had packaged up and sold off the car loans suckers had taken out on its clunkermobiles. And his broker loved him, because whenever Connor phoned in an order for a certain complex derivative, say, a buy order for $300 worth of insurance policies on six-month Gatling gun futures from Zombie Mecca, then it was a good bet that there were going to be a lot fewer Gatling guns in Zombie Mecca in six months or that the Gatling gun would get a power-up, maybe depleted uranium ammo that could rip through ten zombies before stopping, driving the price of the guns way, way up. The broker, in turn, could make money on that prediction by letting his best clients in on the deal. Buying Gatling gun insurance policies, or even Gatling gun futures, or futures on Gatling gun insurance, raking in fat commissions and getting everyone else rich at the same time. So Connor had an advantage. So who was complaining? Who did it hurt? And in turn, 
Connor's broker liked to call him up with hot tips on other financial instruments he might want to consider, financial instruments that came to him from his other clients, a diverse group of highly placed people who were privy to all sorts of secrets and insider knowledge. Every day this week, the broker, Ira, had called up Connor and had a conversation that went like this. Ira. Hey, man, is this a good time? Connor, distractedly, locked in battle with his many screens and their many feeds. I've always got time for you, buddy. You've got my money. Ira. Well. I appreciate it. I'll try to be quick. We've got a new product we're getting behind this week, something that kinda took us by surprise. It's from Mushroom Kingdom, which is weird for us, because Nintendo tends to play all that stuff very close and tight, leaving nothing on the table for the rest of us. But we've got a line on a fully hedged. No risk package that I wanted to give you first crack at, because we're in limited supply. And from there it descended into an indecipherable babble of banker essay, like a bunch of automated text generated by searching the web for fully hedged meaning, we've got a bet that pays out if you win and another that pays out if you lose, so no matter what, you come out ahead, something that everyone promised and no one ever delivered and blowing around the text that came up in the search result snippets, like a verbal whirlwind with fully hedged in the middle of it. The thing was. Connor was really good at speaking banker essay, and this just didn't add up. The payoff was gigantic. 15% in a single quarter, up to 45% in the ideal scenario, and that was in a tight market where most people were happy to be taking in 1 or 2%. This was the kind of promise he associated with crazy. High risk ventures. Not anything fully hedged. He stopped Ira's enthusiastically sputtering explanation, said. You said no risk there, buddy. Ira drew in a breath. Did I say that? Yup. Well, you know. Everything's got a risk. But yeah. I'm putting my own money into this. He swallowed. I don't want to pressure you. Dash quote dot. Connor couldn't help himself, he snorted. Ira had many things going for him, but he was a pushy son of a bitch. Really, but he sounded contrite. Okay, let me be straight with you. I didn't believe it myself, either. None of us did. You know what bond salesmen are like. We've seen it all. But there were kids in the office, straight out of school. These kids, they have a lot more time to play than we do. Connor repressed the snort, but just barely. The last time Ira played a game, it had been World of Warcraft, in the dawn of time. He was a competent, if unimaginative broker, but he was no gamer. That's okay, he also wasn't a pork farmer, but he could still buy pork futures and they were hearing about this stuff from other players. They'd started buying in for themselves, using their monthly bonuses. You know, it's kind of a tradition to treat that bonus money as pennies from heaven and spend it on long shot bets. Anyway, they started to clean up, and clean up, and clean up. So how do you know it's not tapped out? That's the thing. A couple of the old timers bought into it and you know, they started to clean up too. And then I got in on it. Dash quote dot. How long ago? Two months ago, he said. Sheepishly. It's paying a monthly coupon of 16% on average. I've started to move my long-term savings into it too. Two months. How many of your other clients have you brought in on this deal? He felt a curious mixture of anger and elation, how dare Ira keep this to himself, and how fine that he was about to share it. None, Ira was speaking quickly now. Look. Connor, all my cards on the table now. You're the best customer I got. Without you, hell, my take-home paid probably be cut in half. The only reason I haven't brought this to you before now is, you know. There wasn't any more to go around. Any time there was an offer on these things. They'd be snapped up in a second. So what happened? Did all your greedy pals get their fill? Ira laughed. Not hardly. But you know how it goes, as soon as something takes off like these vouchers. There's a lot of people trying to figure out how to make more of them. Turns out there's a bank, one of these offshore ones that some do buy prince's private fortune, and the prince is a doubter. The bank's selling very long bets against these bonds on great terms. They're one-year coupons and they pay off big if the bonds don't crash. So now there's some uncertainty in the pool and some people are flipping.